Hello, everyone, and welcome. I am Samantha, a member of the ICCT communications team. Thank you very much for attending today's webinar. The webinar is being recorded, and we will send out the recording to all participants at a later date. Everyone has their microphones on mute. If you have questions, you can write them in the questions box in the control panel to the right of your screen. After the presentation, we will have a few minutes to answer questions from the audience. The entire webinar should last about 30 minutes. Today, we are going to talk about life cycle greenhouse gas emissions of combustion engine and electric passenger cars in Europe, presented by Georg Beeker. Georg is a researcher on the Berlin team and has done extensive research on life cycle analyses. Before presenting Georg, I would also like to introduce Peter Mock, the EU director at the ICCT. Peter. Thank you very much, Samantha, and welcome everyone to this webinar. I just want to say a few introduction words and emphasize that we typically focus on tailpipe emissions when we work on regulations such as the CO2 regulation in Europe for new, new vehicles. But at the same time, it's extremely important to also keep in mind not only how the tailpipe emissions are evolving, but also the real world emissions and the life cycle emissions of vehicles. And in this respect, we had a very successful and very well-read study on our website from 2018, where we looked at the life cycle emissions of vehicles. And uh, this was one of the reasons why earlier last year, we decided to work on an update for that study and uh, see how the life cycle emissions of different vehicle types uh, are performing these days and how they are um, estimated to develop in the future. And the results of that study, my colleague Georg Bieker will present today. I think it's a fantastic study that is truly international. It compares four major different markets. It is uh, also a teamwork uh, with a lot of work or data and analysis provided by ICCT colleagues internally. And it's uh, a study that looks at a field that is very quickly evolving. So since the original study from 2018, a lot of the data has changed, new developments have, um, have come up and Georg did a very nice job in summarizing those. So I wish you a lot of uh, well, interesting results to see today. And I'm curious to hear your questions afterwards and yeah, enjoy the presentation. Here, please. Yeah, thank you very much, Samantha and Peter. And uh, welcome everybody also from my side. Um, yeah, I would like to present you some results from our LCA study on um, yeah, combustion engine and electric passenger cars in Europe. Um, and the presentation um, first uh, mentions an introduction, then we go to the uh, methodology, and finally uh, I will show you some uh, key results and messages. So for the introduction, um, on this slide you can see uh, what um, scale of greenhouse gas rem emission reductions we need in the transport sector. So uh, if we want to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees C, we need to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions from global transport by 80% in 2050 compared to today's level. And we need to achieve this reduction um, despite uh, um, increasing demand in, uh, in transport. So on a per vehicle basis, the required reduction would even be larger. And um, the idea of this study was to investigate which kind of powertrain types are capable of delivering that deep reduction of, um, of um, road transport or of uh, passenger cars uh, specifically. Um, yeah. So um, now I want to show you five points. Um, or I want to highlight five points of the methodology, which uh, might differ from, from earlier NCA studies. Um, start with the scope. So um, this study uh, was about the four largest or four of the largest vehicle markets, which are China, uh, Europe, the US, and India. And they cover about 70% of the global new passenger car sales. Um, yeah, and this study is a life cycle greenhouse gas emission uh, LCA. Uh, and the uh, greenhouse gas, gas emissions we considered are CO2, methane, and nitrous oxide. And life cycle means two things. One thing is the, the life cycle of the vehicle. So the, all the emissions that correspond to the vehicle um, and battery production, including also the raw material, um, yeah, like extraction and processing, and then the emissions due to maintenance, and then also the emissions or the emission benefits uh, due to recycling, 
due to recycling at the end of life of the vehicles. And then on the other hand, you have the, the fuel cycle, the well to wheel analysis, which um, yeah, covers the fuel electricity production, the uh, for biofuels, especially the indirect land use change emission, emissions, and then also the uh, emissions from the fuel combustion in the vehicles. So yeah, the five points I want to highlight, um, uh, yeah, here's the first one, uh, and that's uh, that we uh, did not only consider the electricity um, of the grid right now, but uh, we covered the improvement of the electricity uh, over the lifetime of the vehicles. So you can see on the right um, the projected changes in the carbon intensity of the electricity grid in the four regions we analyzed. And on the bottom, you can see the European um, line in brown or gray. And um, you can see a worst case and the best case scenario. In case of Europe, you see that it doesn't differ that much, um, not as, as much as in other regions. But the best case scenario is a dotted one. And here um, we consider the policies that are required to reduce the carbon intensity of um, electricity production in a way that would allow us to, um, to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees C. And the solid line is the development of the electricity grid um, that would result from current policies. And so that's the best case and worst case scenario. And you will see that throughout, throughout our analysis, analysis for EVs, we always see a range of values which correspond to this best case and worst case scenario. Um, yeah, we did this not only for electricity, but also for the fuel mix. So also for the fuel mix, we consider the um, yeah, pr improvement um, over the lifetime of the vehicles. Um, yeah, here I want to highlight something about the uh, fuels and especially about the biofuels. Um, because for biofuels, um, it's not only important to look at the emissions, the direct emissions from producing these fuels, but also the indirect land use change emissions from these fuels. And you can see that, um, especially for several biodiesel pathways, uh, like palm oil based, also soybean oil based uh, biodiesel, you have very large contributions of these land use change emissions, which result in even higher uh, carbon intensity levels than you have for fossil diesel. So uh, this figure illustrates that not all kind of biofuels actually have a benefit uh, when it comes to life cycle greenhouse gas emissions. And some, um, especially when you look at corn, which is a very popular or very um, yeah, biofuel that is used in large amounts globally, um, the emission reduction is not as much as one would consider. And then you also have um, residues and, and waste-based biofuels. Um, and for these, you have no or very few uh, indirect land use change emissions. And in result, they're also the overall emissions are very low. So you can see um, that for wet straws, also for uh, animal fats or used cooking oil-based biodiesel, you have very low greenhouse gas emissions and thus a very high reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. And in this study, we consider the current average for Europe, we consider the current average biofuel blends um, and the uh, changes that are expected from um, yeah, the uh, red two uh, until 2030. So for instance, the phase out of, of palm oil um, based biodiesel, but also increasing shares of uh, yeah, sustainable advanced biofuels. The third point is that we do not consider um, just official test values for the fuel consumption of the individual power gen types, but to consider the um, average real world uh, fuel consumption. Um, and we can see that for gasoline, the diesel cars, you have 33% uh, higher or 44% higher emissions than you would have for NEDC. Um, you have similar values for, for HEVs or for, for BEVs or also for fuel cell electric vehicles. But for plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, this is highlighted here, um, the deviation between real-world fuel consumption and, and the official test values is very high. So you can see um, highlighted here for Germany, um, the fuel consum consumption is two to four times higher on average uh, than um, 
yeah, as provided as uh, in the, the NEC or WLTP values. So this makes a huge difference uh, when it comes to their emissions. Then the fourth point is that uh, we use lower greenhouse gas emission numbers for battery production than earlier studies used. And these our numbers are based on yeah, the latest data, which considers uh, or which takes into account the energy consumption from real industrial scale battery production. Whereas earlier studies, um, they were relying on um, yeah, estimations or uh, uh, engineer calculations on uh, based on lab scale or, or pilot scale production plans and with these new numbers uh, from the Greek model um, we we see that the energy consumption is much lower and therefore also the carbon intensity is much lower and in this study we um, assessed the carbon intensity for the most popular battery chemistry today which is NMC622 graphite in the five main uh, regions where batteries are produced produced which are Europe the US, China, North, South Korea, and Japan. And then for each region, we um, use the average mix of batteries imported from these regions or locally, uh, domestically produced. And this uh, results in an average carbon intensity of batteries used in Europe of um, about 60 kilograms CO2 equivalent per kilowatt, kilowatt hour. And then the last point on the methodology is that we consider uh, methane leakage and um, yeah, which occurs from natural gas gas pathways. So for CNG cars, you you have um, methane emissions during the natural gas extraction and processing, natural gas transport distribution, but also you have some, some methane slip from the vehicles. Um, and then when you produce hydrogen out of natural gas, and here it doesn't matter if it's gray or blue hydrogen, which is combined uh, with, with CCS. The upstream emissions are the same. So also here, you would have um, yeah, methane leakage in the upstream for, for this kind of fuel. Um, and methane is um, worrisome because uh, on a 100 year time frame, it has uh, yeah, 30 times the uh, global warming potential of CO2. So one methane molecule uh, contributes 30 times more to global warming than one CO2 molecule. And when you consider the short-term 20-year time frame, um, you even have an 85 times higher global warming potential. So here it really matters, even though the, the emissions are only a few in, in, in grams or in, in tons, um, the effect is much higher um, yeah, for the same amount of, um, uh, of gas. So that, that's very important to, to highlight here. Now I want to show you some key results. Uh, I want to start with an overview over the four regions. And here you can see um, always a comparison of um, the life cycle greenhouse gas emissions of uh, combustion engine gasoline cars and battery electric vehicles. Um, and for each region, you can see it for cars um, like registered this year and cars registered only in, in 2030. And you can see that for all these four regions and uh, already for today when considering the lifetime average um, electricity mix, uh, you see that BEVs offer a greenhouse gas emission benefit. And you can also see that for, for future cars, this benefit uh, increases. But now I want to come to the European results. Um, here I want to highlight that gasoline cars in these slides um, include HEVs, so hydroelectric vehicles are included in the average gasoline car fleet. Uh, and yeah, this, this slide shows that diesel and natural gas cars um, have practically no um, benefit when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions compared to gasoline cars. They are pretty much on the same range. Uh, here you can see it in, in dashed uh, effect when you consider the like short-term 20-year global warming potential for methane emissions. And then in the middle, you can see uh, the greenhouse gas emissions of plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. And uh, here, but also for battery electric vehicles, you see uh, this arrow bar, which indicates the different um, outcome when it comes to the worst case or best case development of the electricity grid. So you see the, the impact, especially for cars 
produced this year is not that, that big for Europe. Um, yeah, but you see that uh, plug in hybrid electric vehicles do not offer that high uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction you would consider from the official test values. In real world usage, it's only 25 to 27% lower than gas on cars. Uh, then uh, we get to battery electric vehicles, and here in Europe, especially, we see a large benefit. So they have uh, like 66 to 69 percent lower emissions so it's only about one third of the emissions of gasoline cars for cars being average cars being registered yeah this year um, then next to it you can see the uh, battery electric vehicles only run by uh, by renewable electricity i will come to that later uh, and then on the right you see two pathways for hydrogen so for fuel cell electric vehicles and here we See, we show two pathways. One is uh, natural gas based hydrogen, so gray hydrogen, and the other one is um, hydrogen uh, produced from you know, renewable electricity or green hydrogen. And for natural gas based hydrogen, you can see uh, yeah, a bit similar to PHEVs, uh, there is not that big reduction in the end in, in greenhouse gas emissions, whereas, um, yeah, um, fuel cell electric vehicles run by green hydrogen offer a large reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. On this slide you can see the same results for the SUV segment. So uh, in the slide before it was only on the, uh, it was for lower medium segment vehicles. Here it's for SUV segment vehicles. Uh, yeah, and the, the results are exactly the same. Um, yeah, on this slide um, I show, um, yeah, when you distinguish the gasoline cars in between conventional gasoline cars and hybrid electric vehicles. And you can see that uh, hybrid electric vehicles reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So they have like 23 to 27% lower fuel consumption in real world usage. Um, and this translates into greenhouse gas emissions savings um, of 20 to 23% on a life cycle basis. So they reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but uh, by far not as much as battery electric vehicles do, which are displayed on the right. And when we look into the future for cars registered in 2030, here again um, it's uh, lower medium segment cars presented. Um, you can see um, that for gasoline, diesel and natural gas cars, you still have about the same um, levels of greenhouse gas emissions, um, PHEVs. Uh, here considered with a with a higher range um, still do not offer that large uh, emission reductions um, or as for battery electric vehicles you can see that that in, in for cars being registered in 10 years even though we consider a larger battery battery uh, the emissions will only be like a, a quarter of the emissions of gasoline cars so we can see that they are very effective in reducing greenhouse gas emissions and Again, for hydrogen, um, you can see the two pathways, the gray hydrogen based on natural gas and the green hydrogen, um, what, the one showing only um, slight emission uh, reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, while the green hydrogen shows a large reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. And when you look at these two renewable electricity-based pathways, so uh, either battery electric vehicles and fuel cell electric vehicles, both run by renewable electricity or hydrogen, um, you can see that these two pathways are actually the only ones that offer uh, the um, emission reduction that we uh, that we need. Like this this 80% I mentioned in the in the beginning, uh, this scale of reduction is only achieved by these two power chain types. Um, it's a bit higher for uh, battery electric vehicles. So the, the emission reduction is a bit higher for battery electric vehicles than for fuel cell electric vehicles. And this is because, um, yeah, you have some, uh, you need more electricity to uh, produce uh, um, the hydrogen you consume than, than for the electricity you could use directly in the car. And that's something I want to emphasize on this next slide. Uh, yeah, here you see the, uh, yeah, the energy demand of, um, yeah, driving a battery electric vehicles compared to a fuel cell electric vehicle, both uh, powered with renewable electricity. You can see that for hydrogen, you first have some energy losses uh, due to the electrolysis. Then you need to compress and transport the hydrogen and then 
uh, you need to uh, yeah, re-electrify the hydrogen in the fuel cell in the vehicle. And this whole um, process uh, corresponds in energy losses. Um, and then in the end, uh, based on average cars, you can see that uh, yeah, the energy demand is about three times higher for green hydrogen compared to um, electricity uh, directly used in battery electric vehicles. Uh, and yeah, that is an important point we need to consider uh, in a world where uh, the availability of renewable electricity is still limited and will also remain limited for the next decades to come. Um, and then on the very right, you can see the extreme version of this e-fuels, uh, which are produced from renewable hydrogen combined with CO2 from the air, um, which are then again uh, yeah, uh, used in a combustion engine in a car, and here it's uh, yeah it's it's extreme. You have a very high energy demand in producing these fuels, and then it's very inefficient to to burn them in a combustion engine vehicle, uh, and therefore in the end you have six times higher uh, energy demand uh, compared to um, directly using the electricity in battery, battery electric vehicles. And as, as I said before, in a world with limited resources, uh, in, with, with limited renewable energy capacity, uh, that, that's, all, that's a concern. Uh, but also this means that with this high demand in energy, we have uh, yeah, quite high costs of producing these kind of fuels. And uh, we have, yeah, we, we conducted some, some studies earlier showing that um, also in the 2040, 2050 timeframe, uh, e-fuels will cost about three euro per uh, liter of diesel equivalent more than fossil fuels. So they, they are very expensive. They would need very high subsidies and even then uh, would only be producible in very low amounts that might be sufficient for aviation uh, or for these kind of um, applications, but certainly uh, won't be producible in that large amounts to um, significantly reduce the, the greenhouse gas emissions from road transport. Yeah, and with this, I want to come to, to the key messages. So um, first is that we can see that not only in Europe, but also in, in China and in the US and in India, uh, battery electric vehicles, um, which is said today, um, have the lowest life cycle greenhouse gas emissions over, uh, over their lifetime. Um, when including the improvement of the grid over the lifetime. And then uh, we see that only battery electric vehicles and hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicles have the potential to be near zero carbon, um, also on the life cycle basis, not only. So these so-called um, zero emission vehicles are actually also on a life cycle basis, the, the lowest uh, emission option. And um, yeah, as there is no realistic pathway to decarbonize combustion engine vehicles, uh, we only have battery electric vehicles and fuel cell electric vehicles to reach the, the climate targets. Um, I um, yeah, discussed a bit on the e-fuels, uh, but maybe also to mention that for, for biofuels, there are some biofuels that have very low carbon um, intensity. So these very like waste and residues based uh, biofuels, including also biogas, um, they, they really have the, the potential to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but they are just not available in quantities that are large enough to have a significant effect on the average fuel mix. So um, yeah, they, they are also not, um, yeah, not, not available in, in sufficient amounts to uh, effectively reduce the, the uh, emissions from road transport. Uh, yeah, then thought from this, um, we need to have a global passenger car fleet that is um, like largely electric by 2050. And in order to have an electric car fleet by 2050, when having a vehicle lifetime of about 18 years, this means that we need to start, uh, or no, that means, this means that we need to stop uh, registering new combustion engine cars uh, in the time frame of 2030 to 2035. Um, since especially cars produced in Europe uh, tend to have a longer lifetime and since um, uh, we uh, have the economic capabilities in Europe, uh, we should rather orient at the earlier 
year of this time frame rather than at the later one. So yeah, with this, I want to finish and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Georg, for the good presentation. Um, I would like to remind everyone that we're going to go to Q&A right now. We don't have a ton of time, but we definitely want to get a few questions in. So if you would just write your questions in the questions box on the right hand side of your control panel. It looks like we've already had a few come in. So we'll start with the first one for you, Georg. Why does your LCA studies show much lower emissions for electric vehicles than in other studies? Uh, yeah, that has several reasons. Like I, I highlighted some uh, points of the methodology in the, in the beginning. I think the most influential one is that we consider like the lifetime average carbon intensity. So we, we think about the, the life of the vehicle that is registered this year, for instance. And therefore, we need to consider also like the, the improvement of the grid um, over the lifetime and not uh, assume as if everything would remain as of today. Okay. Uh, next question is, uh, the person says, you focused on comparing technologies, but have you modeled add-on effect of electrification of new vehicles in combination with renewable fuels for existing fleets? Uh, yeah, so the, the aim of the study is uh, the question, what kind of cars do we want to uh, register as new cars? So where, where should the, the fleet go? Or how should the fleet develop? Uh, it's correct that um, even if we start only registering electric vehicles from 2030, uh, we will still have many decades of having uh, lots of um, combustion engine cars in the fleet and we also need to consider how to decarbonize these cars um, but so so issues um, could in principle play a role here uh, but but as i mentioned they are just very uh, energy intense to produce and very expensive so we don't see uh, them playing a significant role in road transport got it and from the same person, they've also asked a specific question about slide 14. Uh, maybe you want to click back to slide 14 so we can take a look. Um, he is saying that you're showing two cases for battery electric vehicles and fuel cell electric vehicles. How would it look like if you were to do this for ICE with fossil fuel and with renew renewable fuel? Uh, yeah, pretty similar in the end. You can see um, that you can see a slight difference between battery electric vehicles and fuel cell electric vehicles, uh, which is due to the, the so we, we considered life cycle greenhouse gas emissions. So um, also for renewable electricity, we, uh, we have emissions because you need to produce solar panels, you need to produce uh, wind power plants. You also need to maintain these. So there are some, some life cycle greenhouse gas emissions you'd also need to account for renewables. They are not zero but they're close to zero but that's that's the reason why you can still see some difference between battery electric vehicles and uh, hydrogen electric vehicles and if you now have um a cars running solely uh, solely on on e-fuels uh, you would still have um yeah so i don't know um, some some bit higher emissions but um that's not the point um we we only show for battery electric vehicles we show uh, the renewable uh, version here because we see this as the, the future. So in, in 2050, when we have a carbon neutral Europe, uh, the, the power sector will be uh, yeah, largely uh, renewable. Uh, and at, at that time, that will be the emissions of battery electric vehicles. So therefore, we indicated here because that's the projection of the future. Uh, whereas for e fuels, uh, we, we don't see a scenario where the whole fleet could run only on e-fuels. They would, at the maximum, only be um, at, I don't know, one, two, three percent of the fuel mix. So they would not, um, there will be no cars running only on e-fuels, whereas there will be cars running only on renewables, but in the future. Mm -hmm. So a follow-up question from a different person. This is probably more of a, a simple data-related question. Uh, the person is wondering if the greenhouse gas emissions of PHEVs plus e-fuels are available somewhere. 
um, yeah, you can see in the study, you, you see the, um, the fuel and electricity consumption of PHEVs and the emissions of the battery production. Uh, so you can recalculate the, these, these numbers. Uh, but again, we, we only considered the average mix of, of fuels in, in, the, in the final results. Got it. Uh, another question about hybrids. You show that hybrids can deliver an approximately 25% CO2 reduction. Have you done a study to optimize the number of hybrids versus EVs in a resource constrained scenario, i.e. assuming that there is a limited amount of batteries by 2035, what would be the ideal mix of EVs and hybrids? Uh, would be 100% EVs. <laughs> um, so uh, we, we don't see a uh, constraint in, in resource availability. So we have some, some studies showing from, from last, last year, we, we published a study showing that, um, uh, yeah, there are by far enough resources um, available to, uh, to produ produce, uh, yeah, to, to electrify the whole global uh, passenger car fleet. So we, we don't see these constraints. Okay. Uh, here's a little bit of a different question. What is the assumption on average vehicle kilometers driven per year? How many batteries per car can you assume during the lifetime of an electric vehicle? What is the difference between the economic life per car category and ecological lifetime before scrapping? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so for Europe, we consider um, a lifetime of 18 years. And for low and medium uh, cars, we have, in, in, yeah, based on, on German, but also UK numbers, we have about uh, 13 to 40,000 kilometers uh, per year. And this sums up to like 240,000 kilometers as a lifetime mileage. And uh, we uh, consider that the uh, battery will hold for that uh, time. So we, we, uh, we consider that there will be no uh, replacement of the battery required. There is some um, some some data which obviously this is based on. So there there are studies showing that you can uh, run um, state of the art battery for 3,000 4,000 cycles um, and still see less than 20% reduction in the in the capacity uh, of the, in the initial capacity. So um, we we have reason to to consider that uh, also in the application of, of cars uh, that these battery will will hold for for even longer than the, the vehicle lifetime and then could even be used in second life applications um, to serverize the grid for instance um, but that's something uh, we, we have to assume at this point because um, the, the state of the art batteries are only produced now and we have to wait for 20 years to see uh, whether this holds in, in reality, but we, we think it's more realistic to assume that the battery will hold for the whole battery lifetime than considering that they need to be switched at some point. So a follow-up question from that same person, but if the actual lifetime of the battery is seven to eight years, would your answer be the same? Yeah, we don't think that the battery lifetime will be seven to eight years. But if, if it would be, uh, you can see on, on this slide, for instance, if you would double the the yellow part, uh, it would not result in a very different uh, outcome. Okay, uh, here's another question. We probably have time for maybe one or two more. Toyota is promoting increased use of hydrogen to power fuel cells and piston engines that would, that would burn it. Uh, is this a viable decarbonization pathway? Sorry, to burn the hydrogen? Yeah, not sure. Toyota is promoting increased use of hydrogen to power fuel cells and piston engines. Not sure the last part of that question could be a typo, but are you familiar with anything about hydrogen to f power the fuel cells and if this is a viable decarbonization pathway? Uh, yeah, so sure. Uh, we uh, considered uh, fuel cell electric vehicles uh, and here I showed results for two pathways. So either the natural gas based pathway, but the other one is like the uh, green hydrogen based on re renewable electricity. Uh, and we see that for um, gray hydrogen, for hydrogen based on natural gas, there is not uh, a large decarbonization potential, whereas for hydrogen based on renewable electricity, 
uh, we, we see that large greenhouse gas reduction potential. But as I mentioned in the end uh, of the presentation, um, there is a large difference in the energy intensity. And for green hydrogen, you need about three times more energy. So this will be reflected in the costs. Uh, and uh, yeah, also um, might, might be an issue when it comes to availability of renewable electricity. OK. So just one more question that I would like to get in. Um, when you show the difference in efficiency between electricity, hydrogen, and e-fuels, would it be justified to take into account the efficiency at the renewable production site? For example, sunshine, sunshine hours in Germany versus sunshine hours in North Africa. Mm. So these numbers start uh, like um, at, at the solar panel. So we, um, so the carbon, so it, that, that won't be about energy efficiency, right? That that would be the same energy efficiency uh, starting from the solar panel, but that could be an impact on the uh, on the life cycle greenhouse gas emissions of a solar panel, for instance. So you, the solar panel would have a lower carbon intensity when uh, used uh, with more. Uh, sun hours uh, during the life time um, than, than with less. So th I think there that, that would make a difference, but not not for these numbers. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, but, uh, but then also you need to consider that when you produce uh, hydrogen at North, North Africa, um, in, in North African regions, you uh, these are very dry regions and you, for hydrogen you also need water. So that that's a um, an aspect that is uh, usually or that that's quite often overseen uh, that uh, yeah also the availability availability of water need to be considered when thinking about producing hydrogen in northern africa okay thank you for answering that there are a lot of other questions coming in but unfortunately we don't have time to answer all of them uh, so we are out of time i'd like to thank georg again for his presentation and to thank everyone for participating in the presentation. Uh, I would encourage you to reach out to Georg or to us at Communications if you have any further questions about the study or about other studies that ICCT is um, related with. So remember to follow us on Twitter at the ICCT. Thank you again and we hope to see you soon. Thank you very much for joining.